It's been said diversity in all its form is the path to greatness. Nobody understands that better than Anthony McHenry, Chief Executive Officer at Milwaukee Academy of Science. We want strong uh, teachers providing high academic rigor, and we also know that there's benefit of, of a diverse staff uh, because our children are living in a diverse world. This time last year, teachers of color made up about 25 percent of Milwaukee Academy of Science educators. They set a goal to increase that percentage to 45 percent by 2025. And within a year, thanks to a special recruiting effort, they surpassed that goal. I think that um, what, what's important for all of us to understand is that just as it is for kids to have quality teachers regardless of race, uh, the same is true for young people who are of different ethnic backgrounds, whether it be white uh, or Hispanic community. Uh, they also do really, really well when they have minority teachers in front of them. The U.S. Department of Education estimates that students of color, including black, Latino, Asian, and Native American, will make up at least 54 percent of the student body in public schools. Yet 82 percent of educators in elementary and secondary schools are white. Milwaukee Academy of Science has been around for over 20 years, and as they prepare to add a new campus in the fall, they have planned a very special hiring event for teachers. The event is a recruitment of new teachers happening on Wednesday. Every single teacher gets a coach and that coach is with them in their classroom. Lita Mallet is the Chief Academic Officer at Milwaukee Academy of Science. She provides instructional and strategic vision to help students and teachers. It's all around making sure that they have the support um, and the tools and the resources that they need to be as effective as a teacher as they can. Ralph Williams III has been teaching for over 20 years. The most important thing that a, dude, a person can be involved with is seeing a child grow in a positive way. And so, you know, you get in the class, you can see it every single day. He was recruited as a first year teacher at MAS and Teach for America reports that black men make up only 2% of the U.S. public school teaching force. We all know the narrative that's out there in terms of uh, how tough it is as a job to be in education. What we don't do a good job of talking about is the benefits that come with being able to pour into young people. I want to work emergency. Somebody collapsed. I think they're having a seizure. Are they breathing? No matter the call. Bracing County Dispatch Copatic. The calm voice on the receiving end is always the same. Prepare for anything. You know, anything you just, you never know what's going to be on the other side of that call that you get. Or we can look at our phone map, see, you know, depending on the phase of the phone, how well of a ping it's giving us. What's your current location? Wanted for attempted homicide on LE. History of fleeing and eluding. Uh, last information I had, he said it was not going to go down without a fight. I copy. Put the gun down. Gun is still out in his right hand. Still refusing to drop it. Every single officer here wants to help you to make sure you're safe. In the moment, to worry that you know people could lose their lives, it's 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 hard. Copy it, one rescue's in route. A2, we're administering medical. Copy A2, administering medical. You really don't understand until you've actually doing the job what we're going through. Racing County 911, what's the emergency? She's turning purple. Um, She's turning purple? We're not purple? in any room. Okay, stay on the line with me. Get her flat on the ground. If she's turning purple, then we got to do CPR. Sometimes you just have silent car rides home, or sometimes you just got to blast your music with the windows down. It really just depends on the kind of day, but you really have to take care of yourself outside of this room. This room looks much different than any other room Adriana Barones has worked in. From covering a town to now accounting, the volume and severity of the calls just doesn't compare. Sir, can you hear me? Hello? Yep, I'm still here. Can you hear me okay? Adriana was called to this job by her sister who also shares this room with her. I do trust her and we do really well. The trust has to flow from one desk to the next. In the east, west. Lives are on the line and each moment can come down to seconds. Thank you for holding my partner. Had to grab a 911. Was she already helping you or is there something I can help you with?
one person who knows all about the time not on their side. I really thought like you were just going to be answering a few phone calls here and there. Is Amy Kopatic. How many calls that we take on a daily basis is pretty insane. Did your dispatch center send a hit request already or no? She's been sitting here for 14 years. Her mother was also a Racine County dispatcher. Do you ever have those moments where you go home and you're just like, yeah, I do on occasion where you just kind of shut down and just, you know, want to stare at the wall and not talk. But yeah, you get through it. Yeah. And fight another day, I guess. It's, it seems unnatural, but we have to, we have to dig deep and be strong through these calls because we can't afford to break down on people. Amy is the dispatcher you heard on the call at the beginning of this story. Bobby, still refusing command, still has the gun in his hand. What do you think is like the biggest misconception about your job? That's a really good question. Um, I wish people could see a little bit more what our officers and deputies do on a daily basis. We're both 24. I wish they could see what they're up against. Our families want us home. And have a little bit more compassion for them. We all make mistakes. The last thing I want you to do is regret something. Because what they do is just incredible. You got more memories of family to get. It's not too dramatic to say that they don't know if they're coming home. With photojournalist Renisha Donson in Racine County, I'm Simone Woolrich. When you think of Milwaukee's open housing marches, several key figures come to mind. The Honorable Vel Phillips, Father James Groppy, the NAACP Youth Council, and the Commandos. Who were the Commandos and what was their mission? So if they can't protect us, call out somebody who can. The Commandos were a group of young men that came together for the protection of the body, uh, of, of youth council. They were structured, they were well structured. They had rules, they had reg regulations, operational procedures in place, they had an oath. Fred Reed served as the command sergeant major with the Milwaukee NAACP Youth Council Commandos. They were a young group and they called them radicals, but they did what they felt needed to be done. And they did it well. Many of the commandos were military trained Vietnam vets who followed the nonviolent movement taught by Dr. King and Mahatma Gandhi. They formed in October 1966 when NAACP Youth Council members picketed the Eagles Club, which only allowed white members. Some of the kids got roughed around, got hurt. And um, at that point, there was really no official. Uh, protection for them. Shortly after that, the commandos were formed to protect the, the, the kids, the marchers. Who could be a commando? Were there any qualifications that you had to meet? We had no preference to race, creed, anybody. We had, we had white commandos. We had two white commandos um, that I know of. The Youth Council's progress made after the Eagles Club boycott inspired them to continue the movement. So Fair Housing really looks at the quality of housing for African Americans, where they could live, schools that they could go to, neighborhoods. Milwaukee's first black and first female alder person, Belle Phillips, proposed the ordinance. She, along with Father James Groppy, a white Roman Catholic priest who served in the central city, partnered to initiate change. It is Father James Groppy and the commandos who brings natural attention to it. King is trying to do it in Chicago and, and not having a great deal of luck, but it's the march across the 16th Street Viaduct that brings light to the significance of fair housing. The James Groppy Unity Bridge, formerly known as the 16th Street Bridge, was considered the Mason-Dixon line separating the black community from the white community. In August 1967, civil rights activists and other members of the community marched across the bridge for more than 200 consecutive nights to end housing discrimination. Larry Willis was there as a member of the commandos. When I first joined uh, the commando, I saw there as an opportunity to improve the lives not only of my family, but basically all the people in the city of Milwaukee. And I looked at it as an opportunity to uh, express my anger, my frustration, especially with the uh, power structure. He was only 17 when he joined. He says he'll never forget the angry mobs they faced. I saw women getting beat, children getting beat. And so after that, it was like, 
I'll be back the next day. And I was back the next day, got arrested. Joyce McGee was only 14 when she joined the NAACP Youth Council and also marched on the 16th Street Bridge. When you look who was out there, it was young people. Um, so I, I just think we were protected not only by the commandos, we were protected by divinity. Her husband, Ken McGee, was a 13-year-old eighth grader when he joined. We didn't realize how powerful we were. But now looking back in, in retrospect, we, I find that we were an amazing group of kids. When we said we're going to march tonight, everybody was on board. The marches surrounding open housing ultimately led to the passage of the Fair Housing Act in 1968, which still today protects people from discrimination when buying or renting a home in Milwaukee. As a result of what we did here, we changed the nation. In fact, we changed the world. With photojournalist Renisha Donson, Andrea Williams. This is the chamber where the Honorable Vell Phillips made history at the age of 32. She became the first African-American elected to the Milwaukee Common Council and the first woman. She was 80 years young when I had the opportunity to sit down to hear her story of how she continued to crack glass ceilings throughout her life. This is Vell Phillips in her own words. Navelle is a short for a much longer name, which was a family name, Valvalia. And if I were doing it today, I wouldn't have a last name. I'd just call myself my whole name. I'd be Valvalia. When I come back in this world, of course, I do want to come back a Black Panther, but I'll be Valvalia, the Black Panther. <laughs> The late Val Phillips was a North Division High School and Howard University grad. She made history when she became the first African-American woman to graduate from the University of Wisconsin-Madison Law School. First of all, I didn't consider it major at the time. It was just sort of accidental. She and her husband, Dale Phillips, became the first husband and wife legal team admitted to the federal bar in Wisconsin. In 1956, she joined the Milwaukee Common Council. I was the first woman on the city council and the first black. And it made it kind of hard because the aldermen, um, they were very, they just didn't know what to think. They'd never had a woman, you know, didn't want me to use the bathroom. Coverage of her campaign and early career focused more on gender than race. On top of that, to really let them know I was a woman, I was pregnant, five months pregnant. No one knew of her pregnancy except her family, and she had no intention of letting that stop her. I'm here, get you to baby, and I'm not going anywhere. In 1962, she introduced a bill outlawing housing discrimination. Five years later, I just continued to introduce it, continued to be turned down, but never gave up. Her collaboration with Father James Groppy and the NAACP Youth Council made fair housing a reality. In 1971, she became Wisconsin's first African-American judge, and in 1978, she once again made history when she became the first African-American elected as Secretary of State. It's that tenacity that continues to inspire today's female elected officials like Alderwoman Malele A. Coggs. Ms. Phyllis was a mentor to me. Those stories have helped guide me through the challenges that I face each and every single day. Alderman Coggs is just one of 20 Alderwomen who have served at Milwaukee City Hall. And she, like Belle Phillips, now paves the way for other young women with her Girls' Day at City Hall. It lets us women um, feel like if this person can be, do something special and great, which it makes us feel like we can do something special and great, like in the world. Alderwoman Jocasta Zamaripa was the first Latina elected to the State Assembly and Milwaukee Common Council. She's also the first openly LGBTQ member of the council. I had the great honor of meeting Belle Phillips personally, and I treasure those memories. And I also uh, have the great honor of being able to say my very first office, uh, I know, was also Val Phillips' first office here in City Hall. And it, it's the tiniest office, um, but I loved it because I knew um, that it was Val's. There are also people who inspired Val. 
Mrs. Hedgert, who started Columbia Savings and Loan, and she was my godmother. She would send me packages when I was at Howard. Millie Kobe is the goddaughter of Belle Phillips and serves as the vice chair of the community brainstorming organization founded by Mrs. Phillips. I am so honored to not only be her goddaughter and to help to carry legacy and to have been able to walk close with her, but also to be able to help carry out and serve in leadership. From the street naming to the Juvenile Justice Center, there are many reminders of Belle Phillips' many contributions to our city, county, and state. God is good and he put people in my path that could make things possible for me.